Hi there, folks. Um, for anyone who's thinking about Urbana, let me just say that I have seven thousand dollars I'd like to give away. So, don't make it a problem. Money's not a problem. I am so serious, right? I am so serious, right? All the fundraising. I've done all the fundraising to make it possible. Uh, so I'm excited for you all to be there. Uh, but I, I'm also excited that you're here today. I'm thankful uh, that you've taken some time out of your week, out of your evening, to to ask questions, to hear about. Uh, vocation to think about your life to take yourself seriously you, you are here because you deserve to be here to ask these questions and hopefully get some answers I don't purport to have a solution uh, for kind of uh, you know how to answer every particular question but I do think that what we're talking about tonight will give you new perspective on who you are and your time and your focus on what you're doing uh, if you came in uh, and signed at the table you should have gotten a kind of a, a response sheet with like note space and like announcements on the back and all this stuff if you don't have one, just put up a hand, Ted will get you one. Uh, but that's for you, we'd love, to, feel free to use that to take notes and everything. And also there's a response portion at the bottom that we'd love for you to use uh, and fill out as we get in, um, get finished with things. But, so this is week three of our series. Uh, and as we enter week three of our series, uh, I wanna ask you this question. Uh, when was the last time you were afraid? Well, was, it, was it watching a scary movie? I know some people in here get scared watching the trailers for scary movies, right? Uh, was it was it that you was it the time you, you realized you left your keys on the bus? That's pretty bad. <laughs> Getting scared now. Was it was it when you realized you forgot to bring your charger to AAM or Fall Retreat, right? For your phone or your laptop or both, right? Was it walking home at night? It could be any of these things, right? Fear is a common emotion, but I think actually probably the, the last time you were afraid was something else. I think you were probably staring at a textbook or a Microsoft Word document, or an exam, or an application, or an interviewer, or you were, you were staring at your phone telling you that you got a phone call from home, or you're looking at your parents across the table, or you're looking at yourself in the mirror. And you probably were afraid because you felt like you were not doing enough, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, or you're not doing enough of what that's supposed to be. You felt like you were not doing enough. Some of you are in this place where you're like feeling this pressure to figure out your future, like some of you are like really actively feeling that, right? Uh, and and maybe you know the closer you are to graduation, the worse it gets, right? So that's you. <laughs> <laughs> poor poor Woody, right? Some of you, whether you're fourth year or first year, or whatever, are in this place where you're like you're just pretending there's no such thing as pressure. You're like pressure? What pressure? There's no pressure. <laughs> no 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 that 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 crushing weight of anxiety on me. No 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 that's a, this is fine, right? This is so fine, right? No, I, I'm, I'm so happy with the way events are currently unfolding. I, don't, I haven't looked at my GPA. I don't need to. Everything's great, right? Uh, and, and then, you know, of course, I had, I had to go all the way, right? All right. I'm not going to make you stay there, okay? Well, let's go back so you don't have to watch it. So that's where some of you are, right? Some of you are in this, like, hyper-tense, hyper-existential crisis. Some of you are avoiding the question altogether. But the real question is, why is it so difficult in the vocational discernment process to figure out what you're supposed to be doing with your life, or at least why is it so, why is it always so rife with fear? Why is it we always feel fear? Right, now I get it, the stakes are high, and no doubt it's difficult to figure out these big questions, right, but you know, if you were here in our first week of the series, right, we talked about Genesis 1, we learned that God ordained vocation and creation and work, he made it to be a joyful thing. It was supposed to be fun, right? And some of you were here, and maybe you heard that for the first time. You said, wow, work is supposed to be good. I don't have to hate work. Work could be really enjoyable, right? It was supposed to be a place of creation and partnership with him and with one another. And then we even talked about how even though our world is broken, even though there's sin and darkness and disorder, and it's pushing against us, and it's pushing against our purposes in the world and God's purposes in the world, even though that darkness is there, we also learned that Jesus came to make things right, to do what we could not do for ourselves, and fix all things, and make all things new. And many of you are like, yeah, Greg, I know that. Like, like I know that. I was here the first week, you're reiterating it, or you know, maybe, maybe, you, maybe some, many of you in here may be Christians, right? But why does it still feel so hard? Right? Why is it that if you actually know God, which some of you do, and some of you have a relationship with Jesus, why is it that even when you have a relationship with Jesus, it still feels like it's so flipping hard to figure this all out. And I think the reason uh, that our vocational journey is so filled with fear instead of freedom is that we're actually looking at our vocation wrong still. 
We may belong to Christ or we may be exploring who God is, trying to figure that out. But functionally, in our hearts and our actions and our minds, on the real deepest level, we are not letting God be in charge of our process. Right? Well, I might obey and know and be looking at and studying and exploring who Jesus is even, but when it gets onto the ground level, when I'm in the library or in my room or whatever it is, it's like he's not there. Right? That may be a conscious choice, it may be an unconscious choice, but that's not the way it's meant to be because I think we're using our vocation to prove something to somebody. And that's the opposite of what vocation is. Vocation was given to us, and yet we use it to prove ourselves to other people. And I want to talk about how terrible it is, and actually that there is freedom and difference and a different way to live than that. And we're going to do that by looking at this famous poem, uh, a song or a psalm, as they're called in the scriptures, uh, by a king named David. And we'll see that because of God's inescapable love, which he, he spends a lot of time looking at, because of God's inescapable love, we are free to go wherever he leads us. See, before we talk about practicals, before I tell you how you should think about your classes, before we talk about how you should think about your future and your work, we have to talk about how you think about your mind and your heart and yourself. You have to think about that first. And thankfully, there's plenty of places where we can see that in the scripture. So, sorry, we're going to skip over the ugly face. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Psalm 139. This is David writing, and he's reflecting on his life, reflecting on God. And he says this, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my, my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. But before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Man, such knowledge, is, it's too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will, be not, will not be darkness to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them even came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, so this psalm is sort of funny. Go ahead and say that. This psalm is sort of funny. Because for like the first three quarters of it, it's reflective and philosophical and existential and poetic and beautiful. And the last part feels like really oppositional, like so angry, even violent. And you're like, what the heck? Like what? Like David, do you have like, a, like some kind of emotional disorder here? Like what's going on? And he might have. I don't know. But um, what is going on there? Like well, how do you go from all this beauty three quarters to this, this rough, this pushy, this oppositional end? And I think that actually, as we look at this text, we're going to see why it is that way and how this actually gives us courage to live differently than we're living now. See, the first section of verses, David marvels at how God has searched me and known me. David talks about the eerie feeling of realizing that God is everywhere and God utterly knows me. He's there when I decide to sit down or lie down or stay in or go out when I speak or hold my tongue. Uh, David feels surrounded, pressed in. It says, you hem me in behind and before, you lay your hand upon me. That sounds poetic, but I also wonder if David's like almost a little bit freaked out, right? 
But maybe that freaks you out. It freaks me out a little bit. It's okay to say that. Or some of us cannot handle the thought that God might actually be everywhere. Right? It would be really nice if he were just up there and like when I was in church or in a reflective mood, then he saw me. But like if he's like really everywhere, that is like a little scary. Right? That's a little scary. Right? Some of us can't handle that thought and you get nervous if you think about this. Right? We, we get nervous because of the thoughts we have about others. Right? We feel anger, we feel lust, we feel envy, a thousand other things. And then we get nervous about the thoughts we have about ourselves even. We feel pride or fear or depression or shame. And it terrifies us to know that God, the maker of heaven and earth, is utterly present in all that he has made. Right? We get worried that other people will like read a text message that we didn't perfectly compose. And there's God in there seeing every thought before it hits your fingers. And that's kind of scary for some of us. But he's there when you sin and when you fall. He's there before you even do anything. He knows it before it's done. All right, so then David, feeling a little bit freaked out, he wonders if he can escape God. Or maybe, maybe he says, maybe I can climb into the heavens. Yes. Or go down to the depths. Or go to the far east, that's the sun piece. Or go to the far west, that's the sea piece. Or hide myself in the darkness. Uh, but I can't. <laughs> Because God is there, right? It even says, like, oh, if I hide in the darkness, right, like, no one can see me. God's like, no, 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 dude, I, I, I can see you. <laughs> I can see you right there. No, no, you can't. I'm in the darkness. Yeah, darkness is like light to me. Good luck. Good try. Right? Escaping God is a feeling that many of us have felt. Or escaping authority at the very least. Maybe for you, college was meant to be your escape. Maybe you tried to escape God when you came here one way or another. You didn't want to be around God anymore. You didn't want to be around any authority anymore. It could be just parents, right? You were tired of being hemmed in behind and before. And you wanted to be free. You wanted to escape this. But, but if it concerns you, if it scares you that God, the maker of heaven and earth, is everywhere, then friends, you don't know God. You don't know the God of the Bible you don't know the God of the Christian faith. You don't know Father, Son, and Spirit. Lots of people say things about this God. Lots of people say things about what he's like, how mean he is, or whatever. There's reason to say that. We can talk about that if you want to. But you don't know the God we're looking at here. Because as David shares with us, being known, being seen by Father, Son, and Spirit isn't bad. It's actually the best thing that could ever happen to us. David realizes that God made him. Yes, God made him. Right? If God is everywhere, then he was there when I was, when I was born, when I was conceived, when I was imagined, when my parents, and my parents before me, all of them. And he knows that God's creation is wonderful. David knows that. David knows what we talked about in our first week in this series. He knows that when God makes something, God is able to say when it's done, that is good. And about us in particular, he's able to say, that is very good. David knows that deep in his bones. <coughs> God makes things that are good and very good, and it is beautiful to be known by this God. We as human beings were made in God's image to be like God, so that we can also know what it's like to make and see and feel good and very good things. We're able to be like God, to do what God does, to love like God loves. We're, uh, we're also like Him. We're made to make order out of disorder and fullness out of emptiness and meaning out of meaninglessness. And even though the darkness of sin is at work in our world, in our parents' lives, in our lives, in our world, in our school, everywhere, God is still with us. That's what it says. God is there, even in the darkness. God is there. David knows that when you're with God, this real God in the real right way, it's joyful. It's good. It's very good. And David knows plenty of the pain of life, too. It doesn't change that he knows that God is good and it's good to be with him. There's pain, there's suffering, yes, but God is there for all of it. All of it. Nothing that hurts you, that hits you, that crushes you, nothing is a surprise to God. Nothing you've done or that's been done to you is a surprise to God. No sin, no hurt, no shame, no failure is a surprise to God. Because it says God has searched me and he's known me, past, present, and future. He knows all my brokenness, all the things done to me, all the things that I have done. And guess what? He is still there. God doesn't leave. He's still there no matter what happens. He's still there no matter what's been done. He does not leave. And that, folks, is really good news. You see, for many of us, 
We've never known a love that doesn't leave. We've only known a love that demands that we prove ourselves in order to stay. We've known conditional love. The worst part is, for those of us who are Asian American, we know two whole worlds worth of brokenness and unconditional love. Right? Both sides of our ethnic identity and ethnic and cultural experience give us plenty of examples and plenty of places where broken, ungodlike love is taught to us as the normal. You know, so the shame that we feel from our Asian side, that can look like a lot of things, but let me see if this rings true for you. Now, my parents, I'm sure like many of yours, have sacrificed so many things, so many things for me to have the opportunities that I have. And truthfully, genuinely, seriously, I'm so grateful for all that. I'm so grateful for the way that my parents gave time and energy and money and of themselves, and they took risks to give me a better life. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who's felt that, who feels that on a pretty regular basis. Right? So, so for me, I, I went to really great schools. I did the math two weeks ago. By conservative estimate, I don't say this to brag, I say this to actually... Uh, give honor to my parents and appreciate them. If you add up the sum total of my education, because I've been in private schools from uh, fifth grade until I graduated college, my education is $399,960 at the minimum. My parents gave that. Wow. Like, wh I, just, I just think about that and it's an amazing thing. I don't say that to brag. I said to marvel at how generous and giving my parents have been. Man, it's, it's such a wonderful thing for me. I went to the number six school in the nation, I, and we had no financial aid, and I don't have any debt. Because my dad worked extra, my mom worked extra, so that I didn't have to. So that I could go do what I had to do in my life and not have to care. That that was a gift. Wow, what generosity. But yet, but yet in a flash, it's so notable and so clear how our parents' generosity can get turned into debt upon us. I, I remember one time, uh, my dad got angry about something. I, I made him angry about something. It was a really small thing. Now, you know, we argue. If you know my personality, you have to wonder where it comes from. That's the answer, okay? Um, but we were, he got home and he was in sort of a foul mood, and this isn't uncommon. You know, there's grace for that. There's grace for you to come home and be not in a great mood. And then we start bickering about something in the kitchen. It was a really small thing, and, and he was, and I mean this, I'm not saying this just from my perspective. He was really overreacting about this very small thing. And I, I kind of pushed him back on it, and I was like, I don't think you should talk that way about this, or I don't think you should complain about that, or he was getting mad at my mom about something. I just jumped in there and was like, I don't think this is really cool. Like, come on, like, can you not? And because he didn't want to be reasonable or patient, <coughs> he lashed out at me. And he just started going on and on, the rant. Many of you know what the rant is. Every family has their own. Every family has their own, like, stories on the positive end. We've done these things. Dun, 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 right? Every family has their own. You never did this. Dun, 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 right? The positive side on us, the negative side on you. Every family's got their own rant. It sounds a different way for everybody. Or you get, like, the, the silent rant, the cold shoulder, the cold treatment. That's, like, another rant, right? They had one rant one time, you never forgot it because they've been silent the rest of the time. We got their, everybody's family got their own rant, right? Either direct or passive aggressive. You know when they're mad. And this, so this is, here he goes again. Uh, but this time it was really, it was worse than normal. And I think it sticks out in my mind because it was so bad, but also that the thing that we were fighting about originally was so small. But he just went there. He named all these things that he's done for me, and then he's named all these things that I, I'd failed to do for, for him or them or, or something or other. And then uh, he, he compared me to a cousin of mine who's sort of mentally handicapped, and, and I love this cousin. And so when he kind of compared me to kind of being, you're, you're as bad as, you're as incompetent as, this cousin of yours, it was an insult to my cousin and to me at the same time, okay? Uh, and then, you know, he, he, we were, and we just kept trying to keep going. We sat down at the dinner table, and he's still ranting for 10 minutes, and we're still sitting there. And, and even while we're eating, he's still ranting. And then he, he decided to just really throw it all in the ring and said, well, you know, since, you know, you're almost done with college, and, and you seem to just, you, you don't seem to want to be part of this family, that was the assertion, because I had fought him. Well, you know, this can all just end when you graduate. I fulfilled my uh, parental obligation to you. That's what you want. That's how it can be. And just like that, we were in an argument about silverware. Kid you not, about silverware and where it should be on the table. An argument about how my dad was in a bad mood and he's being mean about it, and he, he verbally disowned me. Now, I'm thankful to say that that only happened that one time. I don't have like, a, like 20 years of that before that. That doesn't make it any better. And some of you have had 20 years of hearing that or threatening that at you or around you, which is just as bad. 
Right? That that's a thing that your parents could think of or do to be dispossessed, to be not cared for because you're not good enough, because you didn't work hard enough or didn't prove something. And that's pretty rough. Some of us, when we're faced with a situation, some of you double down and you apologize. And you try to show you're sorry and you're appreciative by you, you get better grades or whatever it is that they really want you to do. Double down. Apologize and be, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Others of us, we push back to prove that we don't need help. That's what I did. I don't need your help. I'm happy that you're gone, right? I don't need you. I'm good. That's how it's going to be. That's the way it is. That's fine. But see, either way, either way, aren't you really just trying to prove yourself? If you're trying to, to appease your parents in this way for these reasons, I'm not saying obeying your parents is a bad thing or honoring your parents is a bad thing. It's totally not. But doing it for these reasons, you're trying to prove something. You're trying to make up for a perceived deficit. Or the other way, you're trying to make up for that de deficit in a different direction. Our Asian experience loads us full of conditional love. The other side is not much better. <coughs> so from American culture side, we are just as pressed. Right, at some point in your childhood, Let's see if this resonates with you. It became abundantly clear that you were Asian. Even if you grew up in this country, you're born here. I'm an American citizen. Many of you are too. It became abundantly clear that you were Asian. You were not white, implicitly. And that somehow you picked up, I'm pretty sure, being Asian was lesser. Not always, but oftentimes, you being different was connoted as you being lesser. Right? People would pull in their eyes. People would laugh at you with kind of made-up Asian sing-song words, condescending fashion. And they would treat you like you don't belong. And they, it might sound real innocuous. Oh, where are you from? And you're like, Annandale? <laughs> but they want to hear, no, 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 Korea or Saigon or Manila or Beijing. Or maybe they make you feel like you're not from here in a much more direct, aggressive, acid way. Go back to where you're from. For many of us, maybe uh, in middle school or high school, uh, this kind of feeling of not being good enough was manifested in a variety of places, but you know, one of them could be romantic anxiety. right? Because all the TV shows you were watching, all the characters you liked, they're all white. All of them. And at best, if there was an Asian, he or she was a sidekick. Usually that's how it worked. It's usually how it worked. Right? Like, uh, and whoever the Asian character was, they were usually comic. They never got the guy or the girl. Not that that's perfect either, but you know, nobody you always got left out. Now, unless you went to TJ, which like a couple of you did, right? None of you really, really thought, oh, I can probably be the in crowd or the quarterback or the prom queen or whatever. Most of us did not think that, or most of us felt like to be that would take a lot of work, which is the same thing. Same as we did with our other situations. Some of us just keep your head down. Some of us kept our heads down and just churned away at the books, and we said, you know what, I don't know what to do with all this. This is really complicated. Uh, I'm just going to hope that, you know, being salutatorian or whatever, that would be good enough to help me find my place. That would be fine. And others of us, we tried to be good at being white. Uh, we joined the sports team. Again, sports are fine. Or we, you know, we, we did something else, like a different organization that was uh, a little more mainstream white, right? Like take photos for the paper or something, right? That's fine. These interests are fine. They're not bad. But how much were you doing them to try to fit in? I mean, how much of it was for the love of the game? And how much of it was because you needed something by being this person? Because by being this, you'd be good enough, you'd be white enough. I remember in high school, I felt like I'd made it when somebody once said, oh, Greg is one of the cool Asians. Which connotes, of course, that most Asians are not cool. Could not be cool. It's only special ones who do special things in special ways. This is not love either. This is not love either. This is a conditional acceptance based upon putting on a costume or a mask to play along with a game or avoid the wrath and the pressure of majority culture. Either way, we're in a tough spot, aren't we? See, this psalm, it matters because God knows all parts of our experience. He knows the good parts of our Asian family background, and he knows the good parts of about our white American culture experience. There are good parts. There absolutely are. A lot of the leadership skills that I learned in mostly white settings have blessed me and been a benefit to me and to many other people. But he also knows all the bad parts and the painful parts of our Asian heritage and our American experience. 
He knows both. How does that relate to us? It relates to us because in so many ways, our vocational journey, our place in the world, what we're doing on earth, we are so, in, in, we're so committed to using it as an attempt to prove uh, something to either one of these sides. We're trying to prove something to either one of these sides. We're trying to prove something to the Asian cultural side. We're trying to prove something to the white cultural side. I'm a good enough son. I'm a good enough American. Right? I'm a good, whatever it is, we're always trying to prove something. I don't want to be as bad as my worthless sister, or whatever your parents say, or cousins, or uncles say. Or that we can make it in this country. We count. We belong. We're trying to prove something so much. Which is why so many of you are doing things you don't really want to do. Or you're doing things on autopilot like a robot. Now, let me give you an example from food. Most of you don't eat things you dislike on a regular basis. <clears throat> like, unless you're like really committed to like a diet or something, right? You're on like Whole30 or whatever weird fad there is. Lots of my staff friends are doing this clean eating thing and I'm like, anyway, whatever, right? <laughs> whatever, it, you usually eat what you like because like, why would you not eat what you, why, why not? Right, like uh, I, I uh, there's a student that I meet with on a regular basis who loves sweets. And, uh, <laughs> and, and in our meetings, um, she and I, on a weekly basis, will laugh about how eating spinach is a spiritual discipline. So painful is it, right? Eating vegetables, eating, like, right? Like, because I don't want to eat spinach when I could have frozen yogurt, right? I don't want to eat, I don't want to eat this when I could have that, right? Why would I want to do that? Now, I'm not saying vegetables are bad. Some of you really like vegetables. That's totally fine. I'm just trying to relate to us here, okay? Right? We don't eat things that we don't like on a general basis, right? Generally in life. But it's funny that we spend hours, whole nights, all nighters, whole weeks, whole semesters, whole years doing things we do not like or care about or find meaningful or true. Now, I'm not saying you're going to love your major or your job like every minute of every day. Like, goodness knows, problem sets are. I don't think there were problem sets in the Garden of Eden, okay? I'm just, right, let's be real, okay? But, but we're doing these things, we're so conscious of not measuring up, we're so conscious of being found worthless, that we will settle for passionless, loveless, lifeless, academic and vocational lives. Why? Why? Why do we treat our academic and vocational life, which is so important, with less care than we treat what we eat in the dining hall. Why? Because we are afraid. We're afraid. We do not believe that we are loved as deeply as God says he loves us. Now for some of you, you're like, I never heard about God before. Totally get that. Welcome to this story, right? For others of us who've grown up in church, we still don't believe even though you've heard it for 20 something years or you've been purportedly told it for 20 something years and it's not been really communicated to you. It's been communicated through a broken lens of Asian or American culture. So we're missing the real message. We do not believe that God created us in our inmost being and that he knit us together in our mother's womb. You don't believe that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You don't believe that your height, or your IQ, or your body type, or your face are beautifully made because somebody somewhere told you otherwise. They're wrong. God does not make bad things. Now, I know that sin in the world messes with that a bunch. That is totally true. That is totally true on a physical, on an emotional, on a spiritual, on a psychological, on a systemic, academic, vocational level. Sin totally messes with all of that. So like how I come out of the womb or in my life is not totally perfect as I'm totally meant to be. But even then, God doesn't think we're hopeless. God doesn't look at us and say bad. He says mine. Mine. Even things that sin has damaged, God still loves. Right? God looks at our scars and he loves us. God looks at our disabilities, our weaknesses, our brokenness, and he sees opportunities to carry us and care for us, not liabilities. He sees our sin and our pain, and he does not run. He comes closer. He knows all that we have gone through and are going through. He does not leave. Which is why David says, when I am, aw when I am awake, when I awake, I'm still with you. I wake up, God is still there. And I don't know if that's the experience of anyone in this room. 
Okay, but maybe you went to bed with someone trying to prove that you're beautiful or brave and you woke up and they were not still with you. And now this verse really matters. Or you have friends who've had that experience. See, we are invited to claim the love of God as our own. It is that simple. It is that simple. It is that simple. We're invited to cl claim the love of God as our own. It's not complicated. It's not a fancy ritual or ceremony or anything you got to go through. It's not very complicated. You don't do like 10 hoops and learn a secret handshake. That's not our religion. Other religions have that. We don't have that. Because becoming a follower of Jesus, becoming right with God, having your life reset, right and made new, is as simple as trusting God who gave himself for us both in the beginning and on the cross. He came that there would be no more question about our worth. That's what he came for. Right? So instead of choosing a major or studying because you're afraid, we can know a life where we are free. Where our identity is secure. Our worth is secure. So we can look at this textbook and, and we can strive for an A, not because I need it for my existential value, but because it's worth, it reflects what I've learned about God's creation. We can go in, into an interview and we're not seeking validation, but we're doing our best to move forward in the life God has for us. We can explore different classes, not because we're fickle, but because God loves all things. And he deserves for his creation to be studied and loved and appreciated and known. To be a student is a reflection of the kingdom of God because God made all this awesome stuff and we're invited to make awesome stuff. And if we don't study, we don't even know how awesome it is. We don't know how awesome it is. Right? I got this one friend at Yale who studies, like, he does like cancer therapy or something or other, and I don't understand half of what he's studying. Okay, like, I don't get it. Like, I, I, my last science class, like, real science class was in high school. It was like a long time ago, okay? But, but if you hear him talk about the things he's doing and, and uh, how he's using bacteria as vectors for this or whatever, or whatever he, if you just listen to him, you hear the passion in his voice, you can tell that he knows how beautiful God is. I may not know how beautiful God is in every way. He certainly does. He can appreciate that through the science that he's doing, he's peering into the amazing order and beauty of God's creation. He can say, man, that is good. That is very good. <coughs> to be a student is to engage in that. It is so, so good. Yes, there are things to turn in. Yes, there are things to apply to. Yes, there's a system that actually kind of matters. That's totally true. But even if there is, can you imagine the freedom of not being afraid? Can you imagine the freedom of not being afraid? Can you imagine not being afraid? Because in Christ, you can be unafraid. If you believe the love of God with every part of you, and if you entrust yourself to him, you can feel that. You can feel that. You could know what it means to not be afraid. You could look at your textbook and not be afraid. You could go on CIS and not be afraid, even when it shuts down and you need to do your homework, right? <laughs> not be afraid. Because in the best sense, who cares? Who cares? One of my other students' disciples that I meet with on a regular basis, she just told me this. We were talking about how she has a crazy paper to do, and like, she was pretty stressed about it. And we talked about, well, could you possibly pray before you start and place your trust in Jesus? Right? You've done it before, you're a Christian, but can you do it in this moment and know that your existence is not on the line? But that God's with you? And she's like, yeah, I can do that. And she tried it. She's up till 5 o'clock. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's really late. I asked her, was it awful? She's like, oh no, it was actually okay. Really? She said, up till 5 o'clock in the morning reading a paper. It was okay? <coughs> yeah, well, if God's with you, how could it not be okay? How could it not be okay when God is with you? Because that's all there is. God says, I have come to make it okay, and not just okay, but good, and not just good, very good again. How could it be anything but that if you know and trust Jesus with every fiber in your body and every minute of your day? Why would you not want to? Why would you rather be afraid when you could be unafraid and see how good things are? Which leads us to the final part of our passage. Right, so this is the part where David changes tone. And he gets kind of all aggressive and mad. And, you know, he's saying, you know, people who oppose God or defame God. And then he gets all angry. And you're like, what are we reading? What is going on here? Now, I think he's mad that people are opposing God because he loves God and, you know, you, you get mad when people get mad at people that you love, right? If you've ever dated someone, you've been, a, you've been friends with someone, someone just kind of says mean things about them, you, you kind of get a little bit frustrated. 
So maybe David's feeling that on God's behalf, which is kind of cute because God does that, you know, it's much bigger, he doesn't need us defending him like this, right? But I also think, I also think that David is, is talking about himself. He's not saying, I'm God, but because he knows God's love for him, he's identifying with God deeply and, and implicitly. David's identity, identity is totally found in God and God's love. And, and David was actually in a very complicated political, professional situation. Lots of enemies. Right? That's an understatement. Like he, this is like the most complicated like, job turnover issue there ever was. Okay, I'm pretty serious. <clears throat> Lots of people who wanted his position saying things to him that were uh, true, half true, not true, all kinds of stuff. And he's just getting frustrated. He's getting so frustrated. People like literally want to try to kill him, and, and not just that, but less, right? Everything too. And they had plans for him that were not God's plans. And they had plans for his life that were not God's plans. And David gets frustrated at that. He is tired of listening to misleading voices and deceptive voices or fear-driven agendas. He's tired of it. He's tired of just sort of running and playing along with these things. He does not want this. Because he knows he's not supposed to have this. I'm not supposed to be in a world where people boss me around and kick me around and make me feel afraid about who I am and what I'm supposed to do. He knows that because of God's love for him. Now, he even calls them his enemies. Some of them were literally his enemies. Like, literally, all they wanted to do was kill him. Some of them actually, it was a bit hyperbolic. It's just a very, he had a really complicated relationship with some people. Like, his, his uh, father-in-law was one of the people that he had a really complicated relationship with. His family was part of the problem. And he called them enemies. Now, I'm not saying we should call our parents enemies. I'm not even saying that we should call this country or American culture our enemy. I'm not saying that, right? What I am saying is that this text invites us to get appropriately mad when people have wrong plans for our lives. We should be mad. We should be frustrated. That there are forces in our lives that would try to impose conditional love or try to lead us by fear. That could be from your Asian side, or your American culture side. But these things should get you appropriately mad. So go ahead you can get mad. You can name that frustration that you have. Half of you already have it. You just put it on Tumblr and you're on secret. You don't show anybody else, okay? You have it. You're pissed off. You're frustrated. You're tired of the phone calls. You're tired of the Thanksgiving dinner thing. You're tired of it. You're tired of it. You're tired of it. You're tired of it. It's okay to say that. Now, there may be ways that you need to purify that because you're being selfish. That like, might be very well true. Let's talk about that, okay? There's also places where it is perfectly righteous and correct to be frustrated that someone who does not love like God is trying to lead you into another plan for your life in a wrong way. Go ahead and get mad. Now see, God's also godly anger doesn't stay in anger forever, right? It doesn't stay in anger forever. It, uh, it, it, it invites us to go to Jesus and choose what's true instead. Uh, you might also feel sadness. Maybe you feel sadness about all the things that are being put on you that you're experiencing. A and you're allowed to feel sad also. You can feel that. You can grieve. Because godly grief doesn't stay in sadness forever either. It also turns back to Jesus. It gives it over to him and receives the true identity that he's given us. You're permitted to feel anger and sadness about this. You're allowed to. Last week at our, at our uh, joint AIV VSA event, we talked about this stuff from a, a more sociological, cultural perspective. I had a student after, some of you know her, I'm not going to name her, but she came up to me after. She ducked out, she ducked out right after the talk was done. I was like, oh, must have to go study for a test, which is fine. You know, I get that. We ran a little bit long. When she came back in five minutes later, and I was like, oh, you're back. That's cool. So we were talking a little bit. I asked her, you know, how, how was it for you? Did you was there anything relevant for you? Did it, you have any questions? And she just started crying. Just started crying, like right there in the back of uh, uh, Newcomb Kaleidoscope. I was like, okay, hi. What's going on here, right? And she was like, this is what you talked about today, the pressure, the anxiety, the, the worthlessness, the question of my worth. That has literally been my life in this really intense way for the last two weeks and in the last six months in the last year. And like I'm going crazy and I, I can't get out of bed. Um, I, I can't get out of bed because I'm so stressed. And I can't face the day because I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't want to go to these classes and do these things. I don't even know what it's for. I don't know what I'm doing. Right? She doesn't know why. She's not from a Christian background, so again, I understand this. She doesn't know why she's here on earth. Right? She's stuck. She felt sad and it was okay. And she, she said, I'm sorry, you know, a lot of people do this, especially if you're Asian. They're crying, like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, why are you sorry? Like, I'm not, I'm not offended by you crying. Like, I'm, I'm fine here, right? Like, we feel shame for feeling sadness or showing emotion or not playing the perfect part or whatever. And I was like, it's totally all right to cry. You're under an immense amount of pressure. I mean, if you weren't crying, I'd be worried. 
But if you weren't crying, I'd be worried. If you weren't angry, if you weren't sad, I would be worried. But you are. That's a good sign. You can feel what you're feeling. God gives you permission to feel it because it's not right to feel this way. You were not meant to feel this way. You were not created to feel this way. Jesus did not come and save you for you to feel this way. That's not what you're meant to feel. You're meant to let that out and give it away and re- renew your experience of being fully loved by, by God so that you can look at your life with the freshness you're meant to have and say yes to the right things. Not out of fear, but out of freedom. So go ahead. Get mad, get sad, push, not meanly, not cruelly, not vindictively, but truthfully. Right? Because, because when we trust Jesus, he knows everything. Right? He, he's like there. God was there, high, low, everywhere. He can look at my cultural experience and say, this was good, Greg, that was not. And you look at this cultural experience and say, this was good, that was not. And you know, God who made the whole universe is smart enough to figure out how to keep what's good and get rid of what's bad if you'll let him instead of doing it yourself all the time. We're allowed to trust him. We're meant to trust him. Life works. It was meant to be that we trust him. So then we can look at the work ethic of our families and keep that. We can look at the optimism of America and we can keep that. We can look at what we're good at. We can look at our practical needs. And as we discuss next week, we can look at the world and what they need. And we can freely go where God calls us to go. We can freely go. Because when God has searched us and loves us and stays. We don't have to be afraid or prove anything. We can go where he calls us to go. Right? Like I said, before we talk about what to do, what to pick, what to be, we need to know who we already are, who God's made us to be. We're going to go down to time of response. I'm going to invite the, the worship team back up. And I want to ask you, what is God inviting you to do? What is he inviting you to do? <coughs> Maybe, sorry, I'll jump ahead. You can use your sheet for this if that helps you. I encourage you to do that so you can put it back. Uh, you can tear off your response card when you're done. Um, but we want you to actually ask God and listen to your life and look at your life and figure out what it is you feel and what you need because you deserve to be free. That's what Jesus says when he came. Like he came to set the captives free. He, just, he came to bring freedom and goodness and life. He came for that. So what's God inviting you to do? Well, the first thing he might be inviting you to do is to receive. Ask yourself, where in my vocational journey am I not living in the love of God? Where in my journey am I not living in the love of God? And I want you to name how God actually feels about you. What do you know to be true about you instead? And then say yes and pray to receive it if you can. You can come up. You're good. Maybe you need to relinquish something. Maybe you need to ask yourself, where in my vocational journey am I living by fear or proving myself? And name it and pray to renounce it. Renounce those fears, those lies, those plans if you can. Because you don't deserve to have them. You don't deserve to have them. You deserve to know the love of God. That's what Jesus says. You deserve to know his love. You deserve to get rid of all this fear. Perfect love, which is God's love, casts out fear. That's what it says. And one more thing. There might be some of you in here who you don't know Jesus. That's totally cool. I get that. Or maybe it's been a really long time. And like I said, it is really that simple. This love can be you and your life. It's so simple. Right? If you want it, just say yes. If you want it, just say yes. I'm not talking about sort of like mere belief or like religious assent. Oh, I believe that God is like this, this, or this. I'm talking about giving him your whole life. And you do that because it's worth it. It's better that way. You were meant for that. God's calling in your life is not punishment for getting saved. It is part of the gift. God's vocation in your life is not him just flinging you to the far corners of the earth like a pawn in his plan. It's the goodness of life, the good and the very good. He wants you to trust him. He's inviting you to trust him with your whole self because you were made for that. And that is far, far better than anything else you're doing. It is far, far better than proving yourself. So as the music begins, as they start, take a look at your sheet, reflect. Write in that card space there. Uh, and we'd love for you when you're ready, you tear it off. And, and before we leave tonight, put it in that little blue box back there. Because we want to pray for you. We want to pray for you as you're responding to what God is doing, what God wants for you. Um, and especially if you chose the, the last thing. If the last thing is there for you, if trusting Jesus the first time is, is you, Please check that. 
And then during worship, come talk to me in the back. So I'd love to welcome you into the life of trusting Jesus with your whole self and how good that is. Because we are meant to receive this love. We were made by this love. We are saved by this love. We are sent forward into vocation by this love because God's perfect love casts out fear. We don't have to be afraid of who we are or aren't or what we've done or haven't done because God is making all things new. We can move fearlessly forward into who we're meant to be. So let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you that your love is, is unabashedly generous. It's crazily generous that all you want to do is give us love, that you see every part of our lives and all you do is love us. You don't run, you don't hide, you don't turn away, you turn to us, you come closer, you draw near because that's what your love is. It's unconditional, freely given for us. God, I pray that as we respond in this time, would you help us identify the areas where we need to receive your love, where we're missing out on your love? Would you help us hear, would you help us listen and hear what you want to give us? In this response, then, would you help us also relinquish fears and false agendas that have been put on us, that we might say no to those things and get appropriately mad and say no. And if there's anybody in here, Lord, that needs to say yes to you, that you want to say yes to you, would you speak to them, would you pull on their heart, would they feel that weight of your love on them and say yes, because your love is better than life. Your love heals our life. Your love is our life. Your life makes all things new. In Jesus, let me pray. Amen.